Good morning, folks. Welcome to another chip break. Today's business lesson is gonna be less is more. We'll talk about that at the end. Yesterday's Wednesday widget, though, on the Keith Rucker cast iron part, the comments were so awesome, and it's funny because when you're in the when you're in the zone, when you're making a part, you don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, you just do your best. But when you've got the benefit of hindsight, um, you can learn a lot. And the comments, uh, they were so good. I wanted to mention a few of them. One of them, I shouldn't have used hardened tool steel gauge blocks that are, that are hard and, and expensive and precise. I should have used some you know aluminum, whether it's just one inch. Um, extrusion which is actually pretty accurate or, or consistent at least or even machine it down because aluminum is gonna bite into that casting it would have been a much more rigid grip um, between the two also a little piece of paper can even help uh, regular printer paper sandpaper a little piece of wood thin piece of wood could help again even between the, say the aluminum and the 246 block below it so some really good tips there I should have had a shot back. I could have mounted one, uh, like a hose, that would have helped pull some of those chips out. I did um, put, we've already cleaned the machine out, I did put some trash bags down, but it was still, I mean, I spent probably an hour or two cleaning up the machine. Uh, and it's funny, because my buddy Amish, who runs a job shop up in British Columbia, was talking about a cast iron job that he did. And you thinking about this idea of, do you build in time when you quote a job on setup? Most people do, and on that on tear down and cleanup, which I think a lot of people probably don't. Um, other really good idea, never even thought of it. Get a bunch of magnets, put a bunch of magnets near the part, let those magnets catch the part. And if you want to watch an old video we did on nine really good uses of magnets in a machine shop, there's a card right here. But one of the tips was putting a magnet inside of a baggie or a block. That way, when you pull it out, you can remove the bag and all the chips just fall away. You don't have to pick them off the magnet. Conventional machining, holy cow. This is like 101. This one I should have known. I did know, I just didn't think of it. There's a good video that I found that you should all watch. If there's one thing I want you guys to do is hit pause and go watch this video from Sandvik on thick to thin cutting and why you need to do it and why you need to get underneath to let that cutter cut when you first take a cut. It's actually something we talk a lot about in our training classes here is why you need to take a certain chip per tooth. Don't rub, let the cutter do its work, but watch this video. We profiled the part. Uh, you saw we walked around it with an end mill to trim up the sides. Once we did that, we no longer had any draft angle and I knew the exact outside profile. We should have switched to soft jaws. That would have been super easy. I didn't even think of it because again, my mindset was fixturing is done. Uh, I later realized we had to profile. Not a huge deal, I, I, I enjoyed the way we did it, and I still would have had to use that fixture setup to hold it, to profile it, but we could have then switched to soft jaws, or if you had to do a run of 10 of these, absolutely the way to go. Then this idea of the fourth axis, uh, or a lathe, and having the, um, dealing with the fact that the screw was at an angle, and compensating for that with a pipe over it, mounted against, or mating against the base flange of the part, is really interesting and so that's what I want to do for the fusion cam that we figured out to do that like rotary swarf operation I'm gonna figure out a way to make another part sort of like that I'll put a screw in it maybe even at an angle and then we're gonna figure out how we can do that because that's gonna be awesome so click subscribe if you want to see something like that coming up so what's going on today in the shop uh, every morning when we come in we have to turn the haws on and warm it up I actually there probably is a way but I want to figure out how to um, automate that because Turning it on and then letting the servos turn on takes about one minute, and then um, you got to run a I don't know, 10, 20 minute spindle warm up. And I want that to just be done when I get into the shop. So I got to figure that out. I'm sure there's a way. I'm actually about to start filming a Wednesday widget, which is we're going to make a part on the Tormach that we're going to use in our pause, which is going to be running here in a minute with these talon grips. We need to make some outside soft jaws that hold the talon grip. So it should be fun, pretty simple part, but a good example, I think. Um, of how I want this shop to run, which is the Haas. I really don't want to run job shop work on it. It's supposed to be, and has been running pretty good amount every day focused on production parts. Um, and the Tormox to me are what we're going to keep using as support machines to do the uh, job shop work, making parts for this, which I like. We'll, we'll see what happens. Speaking of the Haas and big machines, uh, we received two tools as gifts, which I thought were pretty cool. The first is this guy. Um, this is a beautiful Niagara H, I have no idea what that means, HC, a one and a quarter inch by six and a half inch, six flute end mill. I mean, look at this thing. Beautiful tool. 
I have a question for you guys, and it's a completely innocent, dumb question. In the world of insert tooling, why does this tool still exist? I'm not saying it shouldn't exist, I'm asking what, why? Um, I think of that and I think that's so much expensive carbide and serrations make it all the harder to regrind as I understand it. So why wouldn't you buy a solid carbide, one of those shell mills where the inserts run up the side because those inserts, you can rotate them, you can buy different inserts for different grade of material. Uh, again, I'm just kind of curious, what are there, are these super popular, common? Are they being replaced by insert tooling? Um, then the other one is, this was a, you know, worn out, but I suspect it's actually still fine. Sandvik, um, I think it's an 860 Coro mill. Have to look, yep, 861 maybe. Quarter inch by eight inch, so that's 32 times diameter through spindle coolant. So there's two little holes there at the tip and two little holes there, drill. This is crazy. Our local Sandvik distributor brought it, dropped it off, I think one of their customers. Uh, they just, they stopped using these after so many holes or cycles. Uh, but I suspect again, it's still got some life in it. I have no idea if we're gonna use it. It's just cool and it's just fun. And this idea of you know, through spindle coolant delivers coolant right to the cutting point where you want it. Um, we have 300 PSI on the Haas, which as I understand it, starts to work around a quarter inch to a bigger. Smaller than that, the hole is so small that you really need the higher like 500 or 1000 PSI. But here's the thing, when you get into those high PSI, think about that by the way, like our shop air is about 100 PSI. This is liquid, which is not compressible at 300 PSI for us, 1000 for some machines. That is crazy. It's actually breaking the chip as it drills. Just so cool to me. But on that note, today's business lesson is less is more. As we tool up our shop to, you know, for the next year and think about what we're trying to do, I'm realizing that less is more. Less inventory, less hassle, doing more with the fewer number of tools. And it's tough because it's really nice to have a selection of tools. But you know, if you open up my quarter inch bin, I like to do 99% of my quarter inch work with this Lakeshore Carbide tool. And sure, I, it's good to have some stubby ones. I'm sure I've got a stubby one laying around here somewhere. Yeah, this is a stubby for steel. Um, it's good to have a stubby one and you need some long reach ones uh, every once in a while. But I'll tell you, it's a pain in the butt to stock all these different tools. Here's a long one. Um, and know that you've got duplicates and how do you track them and when they get put into the tooling rack and how do you just tool management and tool inventory is a legitimate thing and so I'm realizing there's an easy way to combat that which is try to do a, as much as you can with fewer tools um, and it's a good I think it good tie I like it because it ties back to me as a bootstrapper and trying to actually be a frugal person and it also is just it's a le one less headache that I have to deal with it lets me make parts and not worry about oh I, that 20 thou radius 5 16th end mill that was a little bit longer we just chip welded and I don't have any more so um, that was a one-off type thing so guys hope you enjoyed What's going on with the Haas? We're dialing in our fixture plates. We've got them up on our website. We've been selling them. I love these things. It's amazing though, how much time we're spending dialing in the whole recipe, figuring out the speeds and feeds, figuring out the work holding, the fixturing. We've got to change this up, more vices, more stations on them. The big thing I'm doing right now, we've been interpolating the holes, which is phenomenal, but I'd rather ream them if I can. It's faster and it's gonna be more consistent, I think in terms of having end mill deflection or end mill wear. Um, but I haven't been happy with the reamed hole, which is kind of weird to me. I didn't expect that. So we're dialing that in. They are for sale. We've got them on our website. And once I get this process locked down, that's what I want to share you got the first Haas video uh, with you guys. But I want to show you the whole process that we went through because it's I think it's really cool. We are doing mid-part probing in Fusion 360. We're doing multiple stations, multiple offsets. Uh, the finishes are primo. I, I love it. I really, I really love it. So I don't know, in the next week or two, we'll film that video. Take care, folks. See you soon.